Hello and welcome to your region this week. I'm Anandi Carol Woolery. The Gaslight District in Galt is finally underway. HIP Development celebrated the beginning of this project in a unique groundbreaking ceremony. So tonight's uh, an exciting day for us. We're doing the formal groundbreaking for the Gaslight District. Uh, it's been two and a half, three years in the making and tonight we get to blast some rock and, and celebrate the start of construction for the project. Everybody move back, this is gonna be loud. You ready? All right, here we go. Blast some rock. Yeah. Yeah, no, the condominium is great. There's 400 units and two towers, uh, lots of amenities. We've got a million dollar backyard, uh, a brand new terrace with canopy trees and nature walks and things like that. Uh, the condominiums are well appointed, but really the district is about that whole lifestyle. It's not just about the condominiums. There's bars, cafes, an urban market, a European square, an event space. You know, it really is a place that has all of those urban amenities, not just about uh, bedrooms and kitchens. I am absolutely delighted to be here this evening and finally start to break ground on two exciting new, new towers. We have been watching and waiting for this moment for some time. Right from the first moment I saw the first brochure on Gaslight District, I thought, this is the place that's going to be the place to be. I want you to know that when Waterloo Economic Development Corporation goes around the world, they market Waterloo Region and people don't care if you come from Cambridge, Waterloo, Kitchener or the townships. But our strength is all of those components coming together. And I have to take my hat off to Scott because we can't forget who we are and where we came from. And by preserving fantastic historic buildings like this, but leaping into the future and grabbing it and helping shape it is going to be what continues to propel Waterloo Region forward and will attract people and talent from around the world. I really believe that when we take a heritage site like this, and really promote its heritage features and build in and around it in an adaptive reuse application that will get the best of both worlds. We'll get the best of the history and the heritage of this area as well as some of the new and bold adventures that we can see will be uh, happening right here at the Gaslight District. The City of Guelph and Terraview Homes sold their first completely net zero outfit home. We were there looking at the state of the art home. Oh, it feels fantastic, and I'm just so proud of Guelph and Terraview Homes and Blue Water Energy for making this happen. Uh, you know, the fact that a lot of people talk about the fact we need to be carbon neutral by 2050, and here we are in 2019, and we're building net zero homes. And as you can tell, it's a beautiful home, it's aesthetically pleasing, it's affordable, and it's going to help people save money by saving energy. Well, and from as far as I'm concerned, there's no reason we shouldn't be building uh, near net near net zero ready or net zero uh, communities with all new developments now. Obviously, we have the technology to do that. It helps homeowners save money by saving energy. It helps us meet our climate obligations. And so as far as I'm concerned, every new development should be done just like this one by Terraby Homes. Well, this is right up Guelph's alley. This is, this is the DNA of Guelph. We want this not only from a political point of view, political leadership point of view of both council and staff as well, but this is part of what our community wants as well. And so it's wonderful to see home builders, you know, take up the torch well in advance of, uh, of uh, any type of government regulations because they just are doing the right thing here. So it's wonderful to see. Uh, Andrew Lambden, my partner in this, he and I went to a conference out in San Francisco, West Coast Green, and it was the first green conference and there were all these speakers talking about the environment and the, co and the uh, expense of running houses and the impact of the environment of running a house and that we can build better and we can provide a homeowner with lower costs, better house, healthier house, and we just went, well, why wouldn't you? Like, if you want to set yourself apart from the rest of your competition, then be better than them. So we embraced um, Energy Star when it was a pilot back in 2006, and we've never built a house that isn't at least that since. Uh, we've had buyers come in going, doesn't matter to me, I, I, that's not important to me. I, I just want the cheapest house I can get, so take the Energy Star out of it, right? Give me lesser windows, give me less insulation, don't build as high a quality house because I'm just looking at price point. And we will not 
entertain it because we know that that house is going to serve generations of people and you only get to build it once. So why wouldn't you build it right? Well, what we do in Guelph is we really try to set the stage for any developer to come forward that wants to try to meet these types of standards. And uh, so we have a, a goal in Guelph. Council approved a goal of being a net zero community by 2050. And so really there's two ways any uh, type of community can try to uh, tackle that issue. The first one is in their vehicles, the vehicle fleets. And the second one is in homes and buildings. And so if you really want to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and have better uh, climate mitigation and better stock of homes that are respecting the environment and at the same time they can be respecting your pocketbook because of lower overhead costs, uh, it really comes down to the, the buildings. And so, so there's uh, an opportunity for older stock to be transformed with uh, newer things uh, to make them net zero, or there's new stock like this one that we're in today that would, uh, is, is right out of its turnkey, it's, it's ready to go. Your region this week. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. 570 News' is Mike Farwell speaks with the president of QB Local 2512 about the looming strike of the Catholic School Board's education workers. Joanne Delaney Fraser is the president of QB Local 2512 and joins us to talk about it. Good morning, Joanne. Good morning. How are you? Well, I'll be honest with you right up front, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. Uh, I've got skin in this game because I've got a 13-year-old girl at home who attends, who's in, just began her grade eight year at St. Anne's Catholic Elementary School in Kitchener. So should this strike occur, my kid's staying home on Monday and she's not happy about it, nor am I. No, and um, nor are we, the employees that won't be getting paid. And um, I hope you realize that we are taking this action for your child and for all the children in the school that benefit from the support of the education workers. Okay, so if you're taking this action for the students, how does the strike benefit the students? We're striking in to prove to the Ford government that we are serious. These services we provide need to be in the school. We want him to reverse those cuts, to rescind those pink slips, and to reinstate those programs that they have cut. Which programs have been cut and how many pink slips have been issued? Fortunately, at our local level, there have only been two layoff notices, no pink slips, but at the Toronto area, there have been lots, in excess of hundreds of support workers that have gotten pink slips. So the local action here by 2512 is supporting the CUPE membership across the province. It's one for all and all for one. Yes, it is. What are the issues that are important to you in these negotiations, Joanne? Job security. We need feet on the ground. We need those support workers doing their job, supporting the children that need it. Okay, so what is job? Need, what, what I'm sorry, but what is what does job security look like? Like, how do you not have the job security now? And if you had it, what does it look like? We don't have it now, in the fact that if he's doing all of these cuts to um, to publicly funded schools, at any point in time, they can cut it. We are seeing more and more students coming into the school uh, school system that need support. And we're not getting the increased numbers mm. of um, support workers. We are just getting them added to each one of our timetables. And instead of working maybe with one or two students, we're working with three, four, five, and six. That's not giving those children what they need. So what does job security look like in negotiations? Would that be a new three-year contract whereby the province promises to not lay off any members of the union? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every pink slip that's been given out to have it rescinded, every program that's been cut or put on hold, 
reinstated to give those children that truly need this assistance everything they need to have it. The last time that you and I had a conversation, and that was leading up to the job action that began on Monday of this week, I had an email from a listener who talked about a family member who had been an education support worker. And he told me via email that the benefits package for education workers, like those represented by CUPE, mirrors the benefits packages for teachers in the classroom. Is that true? No. A bold-faced lie. So how is it different? Um, I'm not going to go into specifics because I don't want to pit one union against the other, and I don't begrudge anybody who has... um, gotten a contract with the benefit packages that they deserve against another that's fighting to get it. But I will tell you now, when you are a frontline worker and you are working with students that are um, emotionally and mentally unwell, you take a lot of that on you. You take a lot of the fact that these children that we are working with are coming to school sick So we're having to deal with that and having to deal with it because we love our jobs, not because we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. If a child is sick at school, nine times out of ten, the teacher's asking the EA to look after them. Johnny needs you to sit with him. He's not feeling well. I get that. And when those children are at school, we're their moms and dads. So we're the ones that are comforting them. So, of course, you're going to get sick when you're around sick. You know what it's like with kids. They love to share everything with you, including their germs. Is this action that uh, you have declared, you've given the five days notice, obviously, is this meant to put more pressure on the province to reach a deal with you so you do not have to strike on Monday? Absolutely. We don't want to strike. We want to be at work working with these kids. This is the job that we've chosen to do. This is actually, it's more than a job. It's our life. If you know anybody in the teaching field, in the education field, you know they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they truly, in their heart of hearts, love their job. So if you love your job, why are you willing to walk away from it as of Monday? Because we love the job and the kids we do, and we are tired of watching the board government erode the services that these students need and deserve. And it really, really bothers me when people say, if you love your job, you'd be doing that. Shame on the government, because if they put as much care and concern into the future of these students, we wouldn't be at this part right now. Joanne, we appreciate the time today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Your Region This Week continues after these messages. Welcome back. 519 Sports Online covers the Bluevale Knights versus the KCI Raiders football game. Let's check out all the action. Daniel George getting the start at quarterback for the Blue Veil Knights on Wednesday. Blue Veil going for their first win of the Wicks this season as they battled the Kitchener Collegiate Raiders who have a win and a loss so far this year. First possession for the Raiders. The handoff goes to Cameron O'Brien and it's a big run from O'Brien. He takes the ball down to the 11 yard line. KCI though didn't come away with any points so we remain scoreless. Later, Daniel George with a solid tackle. He plays on both sides of the ball for the Knights. George taking down the speedy Nigel Morris on this play. Then it's George showing his ability to make something out of nothing. Somehow he escapes the pressure he spins and a terrific effort by George to pick up a couple of yards. Next play, George going to the air. Owen Fenton hauls it in. In. 
and the Knights are in the red zone looking to strike. And they cap off the drive with his nine yard touchdown run by Callum Knox. He bulldozes his way into the end zone. Blue Vale taking a 7-3 lead. Second quarter, now the Raiders punting it away. This is Daniel George on the return for the Knights. He picks it up, goes to the right, and look out! Here goes Daniel George. He is speeding down the near sideline, and he is going to score. What a run by George. He gives Blue Vale a 12-point advantage. It's 15-3. Later, the Knights going for a a field goal, but Taylor Snyder with a big play on special teams. He blocks the kick for the Raiders, still 15-3 Blue Vale at the break. Third quarter, KCI with the ball trailing 15-5. The pass is picked off by Josh Reist. The Knights taking over possession near midfield. However, the Raiders defense would step up. George with nowhere to go. Noah Graves and Will Schmidt combining for a sack. Same series, George looking for a man downfield, but there is Taylor Snyder with an interception for the Raiders. Snyder had a solid defensive game for KCI. Fourth quarter now still 15-5. Daniel George on defense picks it off. Daniel George having himself a day. A punt return, an interception, and a little bit of everything. The Cambridge Lions star with an un unbelievable game. Later, here's the dagger. The pass to the near side. Ryan Hansen with the interception. He goes the other way. See you later, Ryan Hansen. It's a pick six. And the Knights pick up their first victory of the season. They beat the Raiders 22-5 on a rainy Wednesday afternoon. Here is Daniel George after the game talking about his punt return TD in the second quarter. I just, ball was a short kick, so it was bounced, and I just saw space to the right. And I heard someone on my team scream, Daniel, come this way. So I was like, all right. So I just followed him and took it to the house. Saw the ball in there, ran under yeah! it. <laughs> Pope Francis unveiled a Kitchener man sculpture of refugees in the Vatican City recognizing the World Day for Migrants and Refugees. The sculpture by Timothy Schmaltz of Kitchener depicts more than 100 migrants and refugees from different cultural and racial backgrounds and time periods. Schmaltz said it was an important message to spread as people become more fearful of strangers isolated by technology. And Fairway Station in Kitchener is getting a new crosswalk installed. The new crosswalk will connect the east side of the bus terminal with the ION platform to ease access to the station and the mall without having pedestrians walk down the busy roadways. Other improvements include a new covered bus shelter and bike shelter later this year. The crosswalk is expected to be completed by mid-October. Every week until the election, your region this week will be sharing the names and parties of the candidates running in your local riding. On October 21st, 2019, voters in the Cambridge riding will have the chance to vote for the candidate they favor the most. The seat is currently held by Liberal MP Brian May, who is running for re-election. Those looking to take over the seat are Sonny Atwal of the Progressive Conservative Party, Scott Hamilton of the New Democratic Party, Michelle Braniff of the Green Party, David Haskell of the People's Party, Manuel Koto of the Marxist-Leninist Party, and George McMorrow of the Veterans Coalition Party. October 21st will be the day where your votes are heard. The local results will have your election results alongside 570 News right here on Rogers TV. Your region this week will be right back. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the OHL from this past week. The Kitchener Rangers started their road trip last Thursday in North Bay, taking on the Battalion. 
North Bay opened the scoring with two unanswered goals until Francesco Pinelli and Jonathan Yancis ties the game up late in the second. No scoring in the third, so tied at 2-2, two to two, they head to overtime where Brad Chernier scores his second of the game on the power play. Brad Chernier with two goals and Nick King for two assists for the battalion. The next day, the Rangers head to the Sioux where the Greyhounds open up with three unanswered goals in the first period. The Rangers attempt to bounce back, scoring two goals in the second period to no avail as the Sioux go on to score two more times, ending the game in a 5-2 loss for the Rangers. Zach Trott with a goal and an assist with Jeremy Pitlick with two assists on the night. Moving over to Sunday, it's the final game of the road trip in Sudbury against the Wolves. Riley Damiani opens the scoring in only 28 seconds. Kitchener up 2-1 going into the second period where Sudbury ties it up making 3-3. Pinelli scores halfway through the third giving Kitchener hope but Sudbury scores with only two minutes left. No scoring in overtime, so we head to a shootout. Byfield and Murray score for the Wolves, handing the Rangers their third straight loss. Riley Damiani with one goal and two assists. Francesco Pinelli with two goals. Quinton Byfield with a goal and two assists for the Wolves. Taking a look at the Guelph Storm as they took on the Owen Sound attack last Friday. With no scoring in the first, Guelph unloads in the second period with four straight goals. Owen Sound unable to answer back and Nico Dawes earns his first shutout of the season in a 4 to nothing win. Uba, Bakanov, McFarlane and Stevenson all with their first goal of the season. The next night, Guelph heads to Owen Sound. Harrison opens up the scoring with the lone goal in the first period for the attack. A goal apiece for Guelph and Owen Sound making a 2-1 game going into the third. With only 40 seconds left, Matthew Phillips scores the game-winning goal for the attack in a 3-2 victory over the Storm. Matthew Phillips with a goal and an assist, and Brady Lyle with two assists for the attack. Taking a look at the schedule for this week, Kitchener against Owen Sound at home this Friday with another game at home Sunday against the Ottawa 67s. Wednesday, the Rangers head to Owen Sound for a rematch. Guelph Storm taking on Flint on Friday, and they head to Sarnia on Sunday against the Sting. That's it for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show, or if you have a story idea, visit our website, rogerstv.com, and fill out the proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.